Francis. Thank you very much. So let us, in fact, start with uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble. So let us start with H, a unitary n times n matrix. Uh, so, and uh, unitary, uh, excuse me, unitary, Hermitian n times n matrix, Hermitian. So we endow the space of uh, n times n Hermitian matrices with the uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. So if I write uh, the matrix Hij, uh, then I write so each uh, non-diagonal matrix of diagonal entry. Uh, above the above diagonal entry is a complex Gaussian standard complex Gaussian, uh, and uh, just each diagonal entry is a standard real Gaussian. So each of diagonal entry is a standard complex Gaussian, and each diagonal entry is a standard real Gaussian. So this is the uh, probability distribution. And then uh, uh, just uh, the distribution of eigenvalues, distribution of eigenvalues of this matrix. Is given by the following formula. So let me write a normalizing constant here whose value uh, we do not uh, compute uh, today. So uh, just the <coughs> uh, distribution of eigenvalues is the uh, following uh, formula, which we also essentially saw at the uh, lecture of Alice. So just a product of the van der Monde determinant. Uh, times the product of weights. So, and um, <coughs> this formula uh, precisely gives rise, so we will be interested in this course mainly on, uh, in the case of the square of the van der Mond determinant, uh, maybe very briefly we'll have time to touch uh, on the cases when, in fact, instead of Hermitian matrices, one considers orthogonal or symplectic matrices, and instead of two, one has one or four, but not today. So, and just the, uh, uh, the uh, aim today, uh, so I start today just by briefly recalling how the sine kernel arises in the analysis of uh, uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble in the analysis of Gaussian Hermitian matrices. So first step is to rewrite uh, the van der Monde determinant as, in fact, product as the van der Monde determinant. So the van der Monde determinant is indeed the van der Monde determinant. So which can be written as determinant of any monic polynomial of family of any monic polynomials and which uh, again by uh, writing the determinant uh, product of determinants as determinant of product can be written this is a purely algebraic identity as sum p l lambda i p l lambda j where uh, uh, where uh, PL are arbitrary monic polynomials. And if the polynomials are not monic, then there will be a constant in this formula. So, but in fact, so this is, uh, this is just purely algebraic identity uh, which does not use anything. Uh, so, but in fact, by the way, is it possible to see here? Is, it, is, it, is, the blackboard, is this part of blackboard visible or not so much? Not so much. 
So maybe I should have a blind spot here. Okay, let me rewrite this here. Okay, like this, is it better? Okay, uh -huh. so uh, L from zero to N minus one. So, however, it is convenient to take PL orthogonal polynomials, uh, convenient to take PL orthogonal polynomials, and there is a reason for that. So, let us take uh, just PKX, Hermit polynomials, that is orthogonal polynomials with, we with weight that is orthogonal polynomials with weight uh, e to the minus x square over 2. And let us write this formula for Hermit polynomials, which we, are, we can, because in fact we can write it for any polynomials. There will be a constant, uh, because Hermit polynomials are not monic. So these are orthonormal, orthonormal Hermit polynomials, orthonormal polynomials. So let me introduce the corresponding kernel, Kn, of xy, of lambda i, lambda j, is the sum, as I wrote, PL lambda i, PL lambda j, and it is convenient for me, it is purely a matter of notational convenience, to insert the weight factor into the kernel. So the weight factor into the kernel, so times, so I write e to the minus lambda i square plus lambda j square over 4. This is just a matter of notational convenience. Okay. And now with this specific choice of the polynomials, one gets a formula which I leave as an exercise but which we can uh, discuss on the blackboard if uh, desired. So uh, I have a formula uh, just that the integral of the determinant Kn lambda i lambda j from i j 1 to k plus 1 d lambda k plus 1 is in fact equal to n minus k the same determinant lambda i lambda j i j from 1 to k so and this the, uh, this uh, formula this is a key formula for us, uh, which is related to the fact that, well, on the one hand, uh, one can easily compute that the integral of kn lambda lambda d lambda is equal to n, precisely because we chose orthonormal Hermit polynomials. And on the other hand, the kernel, by its very definition, and this is where it plays that we have chosen Hermit polynomials, has the property k1 lambda 1 lambda 2 is equal to integral, has the reproducing property lambda 1 lambda 2 d nu. So here it is, the reproducing property. And in fact, 1 and 2 implies star. This is, uh, this is star. This is a straightforward exercise, which I ask uh, those who have never done it, I ask to do. So uh, the point, and this is precisely how determinantal point processes are born, the point is that not just the probability density has, can be represented as a determinant. So it is true that probability density of the eigenvalue distribution of the Gaussian unitary ensemble of the distribution of uh, Hermitian matrices with Gaussian independent entries can be represented as a determinant. But the point is that the projections of this measure 
can also be represented as a determinant. Can also be represented as a determinant. So in other words, the correlation functions, so the correlation functions, now let us, uh, uh, let us look at the correlation functions. Let me recall the definition of the correlation functions. In fact, in this case, let me just say, and I will give general definition later, that in this case, by correlation function, I mean precisely integral of probability density over, uh, over uh, uh, some of the variables. Some of the variables. So correlation function of order one is integral of uh, probability density with respect to all variables except one of them. Uh, of order two is integral of um, correlation function, uh, or integral of the density of all variables except two of them, and so on. So the correlation functions uh, have the form rho L lambda 1 lambda L is the determinant of K N lambda I lambda J I J from 1 to L. So the beauty of this formula and the usefulness of this formula uh, is due to the fact that in the computation of L's correlation function, I only have determinant L times L. Determinant L times L. So, the, uh, so let us imagine that we consider a matrix million by million. So this is some huge matrix with very many eigenvalues. So this is some huge determinant, million by million, uh, which uh, it is absolutely impossible to compute. At the same time, what I want to know, what I want to know is how many eigenvalues I have in some fixed interval. How many eigenvalues I have in some fixed interval. But for this, I don't need to know the whole determinant. I only need to know the first correlation function. Uh, I only need to know rho 1 of lambda lambda d lambda. This is by definition, so I need to integrate all of the Superfluous, superfluous variables. So, and precisely this correlation function is what I have from formula star, which I did not prove but left as exercise. So, this is Kn lambda lambda d lambda. It is indeed, it stands to reason that the expectation of the number of particles, well, it comes from the, uh, from the definition of our problem, the expectation of number of particles is n, as in fact it is here. So uh, just this is the first correlation function. The second correlation function, if I want to know how many pairs of particles belong to uh, a given square, so I need to compute the second correlation function, but it is just the determinant of this matrix, and so on. Lambda, lambda, Kn, lambda, 1, lambda, 2, Kn, lambda, 2, lambda, 1, but our kernel is symmetric and Kn lambda 2 lambda 2. By the way, already at this stage, I would like to make a remark which uh, we will uh, exploit repeatedly in this course is that the second correlation function minus the product of the, fir the first correlation functions. So, well, in the determinant, there is a diagonal term and there are off diagonal terms, so the determinant is the product of diagonal terms minus the off diagonal terms. So what I get is minus Kn lambda 1 lambda 2 square d lambda 1 d lambda 2. Oh, well, no, d lambda 1 d lambda 2. Okay, just equal. So in fact, our eigenvalues are what is called negatively correlated. The presence of an eigenvalue in a given position exerts a negative influence on the presence of an eigenvalue at another position. It is less probable, conditioning on the fact that there is an eigenvalue somewhere, it is less probable that there will be an eigenvalue somewhere else. So here it is, the correlation is negative. This is something that we will repeatedly exploit. And in fact, it stands, it perfectly does stand to reason that eigenvalues repel. So uh, just uh, in the same way as, for example, roots of polynomial repel. So it's also very clear from the formula with uh, uh, determinant. So eigenvalues don't like to be close together. It is highly improbable, it is highly improbable uh, that uh, eigenvalues 
cluster in a, a cluster in a small interval. In fact, uh, I expect to prove in this course that uh, if I have an interval i, then the probability is that the number of eigenvalues is greater than some number k decays as e to the alpha k square, where alpha depends on i. Uh, uh, so, but uh, let us uh, not go into that. Just let us uh, observe that the uh, not the number of uh, so the number of eigenvalues decays very fast. In fact, we will see uh, uh, why this is so. It is possible to see this by looking attentively at the formula with the van der Mond determinant. So it has. Uh, so it is very hugely improbable that eigenvalues cluster. And uh, the first rep uh, representation of this we see here. OK. But now, uh, this was a digression. And now what I want to say is that this formula naturally motivates one. Please observe that in this formula, the only dependence on n, the only dependence on n is here in the appearance of Kn. So the structure of the formula, the determinantal structure of the formula does not depend on n. The only thing that depends on n is itself the kernel kn. So this setup makes it uh, very natural to try to effectuate a transition to the limit, to the limit as n goes to infinity. So and in fact, so let me quote a result which I will not prove uh, in this course. So the semicircle law of Wigner, not only will I not prove it, in fact, I will not even formulate it. So uh, I will uh, formulate it vaguely. So the structure of the eigenvalues, so the distribution of the eigenvalues of an Hermitian uh, Gaussian matrix, of the matrix of the Gaussian unitary ensemble. Uh, so the <coughs> eigenvalues uh, are distributed according to a semicircle. According to a semicircle. So uh, there are n, uh, so my matrix H has n eigenvalues. So they live, this is a theorem of Wigner, uh, they live uh, in the interval from 2 square root of n to minus 2 square root of n. Again, uh, precise formulation of this theorem requires effort, and I won't. Uh, but one can check, uh, one can now, uh, it is possible just even to Google the Wigner semicircle law and to find everything you want to know about it. But just uh, the eigenvalues live on interval from minus 2 square root of n to 2 square root of n. So there are n of them. So the typical spacing between eigenvalues is uh, of uh, size 1 over square root of n. And the distribution of eigenvalues obeys the semicircle uh, density, so which I write here. Uh, so uh, just uh, the semicircle density. Here it is. OK. Question? Yes, yes, excuse me. Just a second, I mean, if I now rescale, so excellent point, if I rescale, excellent point, thank you very much. If I rescale, so very, very good point. If I rescale, but I will need, thank you very much, I need this rescaled density. So if I rescale the circle to become a circle of radius two, then uh, the distribution of eigenvalues obeys this semicircle density. Okay, so now, so this was theorem of Wigner, now I, come to formulating, and at this point, non-rigorously, but uh, in fact, we will, we will formulate it rigorously. So a theorem of Dyson. So Dyson is interested in the local statistics of eigenvalues. So the theorem of Wigner can be seen as an analog in this situation of the law of large numbers, of the law of large numbers. So this is, or this is a theorem of, of, on limit shape. So eigenvalues have a limit shape. So the a natural next question is the question about deviation from the limit shape. And so the deviation from the limit shape is, uh, uh, so Wigner, play, uh, Dyson, excuse me, Dyson uh, places himself 
in some position of this semicircle curve, so it can be different positions, and looks around him. So looks around him. So important thing is that he not place himself at the edge of the curve because then the picture is completely different. But uh, when he places himself in the bulk of the curve, Dyson, so he sees, obviously, the closest eigenvalue is a distance 1 over square root of n from him. So he needs to make homotity, so without even scaling. So I wrote the formula with scaling, but the picture is without scaling. So Dyson uh, is observing the picture without scaling. So he needs to effectuate homotity with coefficient square root of n. OK, he does that. And then it is clear to Dyson that he needs to look at the asymptotics of this kernel, asymptotics of this kernel with this scaling. So that is to say, he looks at the kernel uh, in uh, the uh, he takes some epsilon between minus 2 and 2 strictly. So he looks at plus x over square root of n, plus y over square root of n. So in fact, uh, he puts also the value, clearly the, the value of the density plays a role, the value of the density plays a role, so he puts it here. And then let me again say, uh, not rigorously, but this statement can be made rigorous, in fact it's a very classical theorem of Sigur. So every orthogonal polynomial in the bulk, it looks like sine function. So it is, can be proved in very substantial generality. An orthogonal, polyno orthogonal polynomials, uh, orthogonal polynomial of order n has n uh, zeros uh, and oscillates between them. So it, stands, it perfectly stands to reason that it should look like sine function. So, and in fact, it does. So in this scaling, Hermit polynomials uh, behave as the sine function. This is called the plancharel rotach asymptotic. And so the limit of this, so I always write this formula with mistakes, so I check with sources. So the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, so is, in fact, it has a limit. It has a limit and, uh, in fact, so as I said by classical asymptotics, which is true for uh, very general for orthogonal polynomial, this is sine. So there is sine, uh, and then there is another sine, and then one obtains, what one obtains is the difference of signs. Uh, from the christoffel darbu formula, and then the difference of arguments. So this uh, proof of this requires a quite non-trivial amount of effort, but let me just at this moment write the formula and look at it. So under the scaling, when Dyson observes the behavior of the eigenvalues in uh, any position in the bulk of Wigner's semicircle curve, Dyson uh, sees a limit distribution for rescaled eigenvalues. And so the question arises, so does there exist such distribution of probability on, so obviously here n goes to infinity, so it cannot be a collect, finite collection of eigenvalues, it must be infinite collection of eigenvalues. So does there exist such distribution of probability for infinite, on infinite collection of points on the real line? Because clearly uh, Dyson, he sees not just the closest eigenvalue to him, he also sees the closest, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and so on. So he sees a full collection of eigenvalues. And the correlation function between this collection of eigenvalues are given by this formula. And so after these preliminaries, we are ready to formulate rigorously one of the main definitions of the course. Uh, this will take a little bit of time. So uh, let, uh, because in fact, to formulate, uh, uh, to define the Dyson sign process, first of all, one needs to define what does it mean, point process. 
so what, what is the meaning of the word point process? And I will <coughs> do this now. So in their classical introduction to point processes, uh, Daly and Via Jones uh, trace the seer of point processes to the work of John Grant in the 17th century. Uh, so uh, John Grant, uh, around 1615, uh, just uh, was the first to compile mortality tables in the city of London. So it was, in fact, the first uh, sustained effort at studying demographics of London. In particular, he observed that growth of the population of the city of London is three times as high as the growth of the population of the Kingdom of England. Plus a change, plus la même chose. And, uh, so, and he observed also how it changes by neighborhood and so forth. So uh, just the point is that he was investigating a sequence of indistinguishable random events, at this, in this setting, deaths in the city of London. So uh, indistinguishable random events, which happen, in his case, in, in, a, uh, in a certain span of time. So uh, we consider, therefore, we are interested in the distribution of probability in the space of subs of subsets of collection of points in R. Let's start with the case of R. So a collection of points in R is called configuration on R. So we introduce the space of configurations on R is uh, the space of sets. X is a set without accumulation points. Set, so X I will write. So this will be called the configuration. Configuration. And this will be called a particle of a configuration. So uh, just x does not have accumulation points. Have accumulation points. Accumulation points. So this is our space. So this space uh, uh, has, uh, it's a, Polish space, it's a complete separable metric space, uh, in, uh, in particular because, in fact, this is, can be viewed as space of measures. So to x, one can assign the Radon measure sum of delta x. It's a Radon measure in the sense that it assigns finite weight to every compact set, by definition. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, this uh, space inherits the topology of uh, uh, the space of measures. So the space of measures naturally has the vague topology, topology of convergence on compactly supported functions, uh, which turns it into a metric space. And so this space inherits this topology. Uh, informally, this topology can be explained in a very simple way. What is neighborhood of configuration? What does it mean, neighborhood of configuration? So I can illustrate it by a drawing. What does it mean, neighborhood of configuration? So take an interval. Take an interval. So here the points oscillate a little bit. Oscillate a little bit. And here you do what you want. Do what you want. So this is neighborhood of configuration. And here also do what you want. Do what you want. So, uh, so its neighborhood is defined by, so one, uh, two configurations are close between themselves if they coincide, if they are close on a large compact set and beyond this compact set they do whatever they want. So this is, this is uh, our uh, topology which in fact, as I said, comes from topology on the space of, <coughs> topology uh, on, the spa uh, on the space of measures, topology on the space of measures. Okay, so let me uh, also say that, in fact, I introduced this topology, but I don't really need it very much, because, in fact, I can consider just the Borel structure, and the Borel structure is, uh, Borel structure is uh, uh, given by what's called occupation variable. So I write 
Hash A, A is a Borel subset of R, Borel subset of R. R, and so hash A of X is the cardinality of intersection of A and X. So, and <clears throat> the uh, Borel structure is induced, so Borel structure on, so this is a proposition, so Bor Borel structure induced by, induced by the collection of all hash A. So A Borel, found in Borel, coincides with the Borel structure induced by the metric, coincides with the Borel structure induced by the metric. Structure induced by the metric. So uh, this is something of which one can convince oneself. And uh, the, <coughs> the uh, point is that in order to define a point process, it suffices to define joint distributions of these hash A's. So a point process is uniquely defined. A point process is uniquely defined once, so let me write this. A point, pro a point process is uniquely defined while once the joint distributions of hash A's are specified. A point process is uniquely And once joint, once joint distributions are specified, are specified, are specified. Joint distributions, distributions. Let me write. Okay. So, okay. So now I am ready to formulate the definition of the correlation function, which I haven't yet. So, uh, <coughs> uh, correlation function, uh, I will, uh, so if, uh, oh, excuse me, so point process is just a Borel probability measure, so P is Borel probability measure on, probability measure on the space of configurations. So this is the same by definition as a point process on R. Okay, so now the correlation functions of a point process are uh, just defined as follows, that just I consider a function f continuous with compact support, f continuous with compact support on Rk, Rl, and I consider sum of f x i1, x i l. So this sum over all choices of all ordered choices, all ordered choices of L distinct particles, particles in X. So this integral over the space of configurations, should it converge, is by the least representation theorem, is the integral of F Y1 Y L. And in fact, uh, so it is integral of f with respect to some measure, and this measure is precisely the correlation measure. So this is the definition of the correlation measure, and in all our examples, the measure will admit a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, and the density is, of course, the correlation function. So, So again, there are many uh, delicate uh, uh, points here, uh, which I will only pass only very briefly. So, uh, because in fact, in all our examples, all these conditions are verified. So it is not, there is absolutely no reason why correlation functions should exist. So it is just, so it happens that in our examples they exist. And the fact that correlation functions determine a process uniquely, uh, is a fact which is related to the correct uh, well-posedness of the moment problems. And so let me leave a little exercise which we can discuss 
if desired next time, is that correlation functions determine joint moments, not joint distributions, but joint moments. Correlation functions determine joint moments of the occupation variables. Determine joint moments of moments of hash A1, hash AL. Joint moments of hash A1, hash L. And so at this point, if the moment problem is well posed, which in this situation it is, it follows that the correlation functions are, uh, excuse me, that the correlation functions determine the process uniquely. And so I am ready to formulate one of the main definitions of the course. The sign process, the sign process is a point process on R, point process on R, whose correlation functions, whose correlation functions have the form rho L x1 xl equals to determinant s xi xj where s is s of xy is this so this is the definition of the sign process there is a very naive question uh, that arises here. Why does the sign process exist? Yes, Pasha. Just a short question. There is an integral here. Ah, there is an integral. integral. There is an integral. Yes, yes, yes. There is an integral. Yes. DP. Yes, this, this is what is missing. Yes, thank you very much. DP, of course. Thank you very much. Yes. DP, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, yes. There is an integral. Yes. Something else missing, maybe? So. Uh, Okay, so just the, this is point process on R whose correlation functions have this form. So a question arises, why does such point process exist? Why does such point process exist? So from this vague discussion, I more or less explained why uh, this process is, should it exist, is unique. But in fact, also we will, I will give different proof uh, later, maybe even this time. But uh, the question why it exists, it remains a question which we will discuss in this course. So in fact, full proof of existence appeared much later than in fact the sign process was written. Sign process was written in the 60s. Then in a revolutionary paper, Odile Maquis, a French physicist, she suggested a general determinantal model for this kind of uh, processes, which she called fermionic processes, and which today, following Boradin uh, and Alshansky, we call determinantal processes. Uh, but mm, uh, she did not prove the existence of the sign process. And in fact, the proof of the existence of the sign process is already a result of the new millennium uh, of the work of Soshnikov and independently and simultaneously Shirai and Takahashi. So uh, I should say, uh, today, the proof can be given on two lines, and I will, but just uh, for the moment, I want to point out that the fact that such process exists is uh, a question, so it's uh, not obvious at all why such process exists. Okay, so uh, let me uh, just uh, say uh, what we want to do with the sign process, what we want to do, where, where uh, we are going with the sign process. And so let me uh, now make a little jump and explain some of the dynamical properties of the sign process. So let me point out that I consider not the finite particle case, but immediately I consider the infinite particle case. So I will, in this course, uh, I will study the sign process and its, well, many other determinate processes, but I will study directly the infinite particle limit. So, and uh, first statement that I would like to formulate is, uh, in fact, uh, a central limit theorem for the sign process. So let us consider, so one can ask, how does this infinite configuration, how does this infinite configuration behave? How does this infinite configuration behave? <clears throat>
how does this infinite configuration behave. So, and uh, uh, the <coughs> One uh, of results about this is the uh, central limit theorem, which was proved in this uh, for specifically for the science process by Kostin Lebowitz and in full generality by uh, Soshnikov. So, uh, is the following statement. So, let us consider first the number of particles for the science process. So let's consider, let's denote hash n of x is just the number of particles in the interval from 0 to n. So it is clear that the expectation is n plus 1. The expectation, so please observe that the intensity of the sign process is 1. So the first correlation function is identically equal to 1. Is identically equal to 1. Well, this is why we chose scaling in such a way. So it's a stationary process. It's a stationary process, so the expectation of n is equal to n plus 1. On the other hand, one can already see the phenomenon of repulsion, which I uh, briefly mentioned before. One can see a manifestation of it in the fact that the variance of this random variable grows very, very slowly. The variance of this is, in fact, 1 over pi square log n. Plus O large of one. This is O large. So, uh, so the variance, as opposed to let's say Poisson process, uh, so as opposed to situation where points are thrown independently on the line, so the variance grows very very slowly. So the configuration is very ordered. So and uh, this is just specific manifestation. Nonetheless, we will see many, many manifestations of this. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, nonetheless, so as Kostlevitz and Soshnikov proved, the quantity hash n minus expectation and over the square root of the variance converges to the normal law. Converges to the normal law. Okay, so this limit theorem of Kostlevitz uh, uh, and Soshnikov, it has a functional analog, so functional analog, which we proved in joint work with Dimov, uh, just there is also analog of this statement for um, in space of functions, but in fact it is different from uh, don't square invariance principle. So, in fact, I consider the quantity hash Tn. So, and uh, I need to consider, uh, so I write, so hash Tn minus, so this uh, normalized quantity of the variance, and then I need to consider the integral of this dt. So, uh, if I consider just this quantity, there is no convergence, there is no convergence in to a uh, limiting process. So there is no convergence in the space of continuous functions. But on the other hand, if I consider the integral, then this quantity does converge in the space of continuous functions. Uh, and so let's denote this xi tau. So xi tau converges to a Gaussian process, converges to a Gaussian process which one can find explicitly. Process with, 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 for which one can explicitly compute all the quantities. By the way, I should say uh, this result, we proved it for sign process, but the method is specific to sign process, and even, for example, for the process with the Eric kernel, we don't have a proof. So it seems that it should, be, it should hold uh, in great generality because uh, somehow it is related to the Gaussian free field, and so it should always hold, but we don't have a proof. We don't have a proof even for uh, Eric process. So then uh, the sign uh, process has a remarkable property of rigidity of Gauche and Perez. Perez rigidity, which is uh, quite remarkable. So uh, <coughs> uh, the Gauche and Perez rigidity says that 
uh, if I fix the configuration of the sign process, if I fix the configuration of the sign process beyond a certain interval, I fix the configuration of the sign process beyond a certain interval. Then the number of particles, the number of particles in the interval, so Gaussian Pensergy says that the number of particles in the interval belongs to the sigma algebra, to the sigma algebra which is spanned by events A, A beyond the interval. So this is quite a remarkable statement. Uh, a quite remarkable statement is that just uh, <clears throat> if I close this interval, uh, then it is possible to determine the number of particles in this interval by looking just at the complement, by looking just at the complement of the interval. Okay. And uh, let me point out that this statement can be, uh, in this specific case, in the stationary case, this statement can be derived from theorem of Kolmogorov from 41 about uh, interpolation for stationary processes. Uh, so, uh, in fact, Kolmogorov has a spectral cr criterion for interpolation of stationary processes, and it is possible to derive the gauche perez uh, statement from this, from the Kolmogorov theorem. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and let me just say that the number of particles is fixed, but their positions are not. The number of particles is fixed, but their positions are not. And in fact, it is possible to compute, this is another result uh, that we will uh, discuss in the course, it is possible to compute the distribution of the positions of these particles. So, their number is fixed. So if I have the fixed particles x here, then the conditional distribution, conditional distribution of T1 Tn, of T1 Tn, with fixed, with fixed, X, which is the intersection of the configuration to the complement of the interval. So this conditional distribution, so this is essentially, one can say that one, we are discussing the analog of the Gibbs property for the sign process, and in fact the sign process does satisfy the analog of the Gibbs property, and uh, uh, <coughs> the analog of the Gibbs property, uh, uh, just with the restrictions that the number of particles is fixed. So the number of particles is fixed, but then the Gibbs property holds, and in fact, the potential of interaction is, well, what Alice mentioned uh, in the first, uh, so the, the Coulomb potential in the first class, the Coulomb potential, and just, I formulate the result precisely, the conditional distribution is equal to, it's an orthogonal polynomial ensemble, so I have the square of the van der Mond. And I have the weight, and the weight is given by the following product, 1 minus ti over x, so it's a double product, product obviously over i from 1 to n, and product over x in x w without i, and this product is taken in principal values because otherwise it fails to converge, there is a square here too, so, and just this is the formula for the conditional measure, this is the formula for the conditional measure, and uh, um, <coughs> Let me just say that how can one understand, how one can understand this formula very simply. Uh, this is a formula as if the sign process were an orthogonal polynomial ensemble with uniform weight and infinitely many particles. So if one writes for such formula for conditional measures for orthogonal polynomial ensemble, one will get multiples of this kind. So here one can formally pass to the limit on the condition, on the condition, and in fact, obtain the formula, so this product converges, obtain the formula as if the sign process were an orthogonal polynomial ensemble with infinitely many particles. And uh, just, uh, the formula is correct. The formula is correct for the sign 
process, and we will discuss it in detail in this course. So, and in the remaining 10 minutes, let me say uh, just the following, that from gauche Perez rigidity, gauche uh, derives a remarkable corollary for the sign process. The corollary he derives is the following, that if one takes, so uh, to motivate this corollary, let me point out that the sign kernel is the kernel of projection onto the paley wiener space, onto the space of functions with compact support, uh, space of functions with Fourier transform is in compact support. So Gauche proves, using the gauche perez rigidity, that the family of functions e to the i x t, so where x is in x, is realization of sign process, and t is a formal variable, t is in minus pi pi. So this function, this function sequence, is complete, is complete in L2 of minus pi pi. And in fact, it was conjectured by Lyons and Perez that such result holds in full generality for determinantal point processes, and this is what we proved with Jan Shishu and Alexander Shamov. And let me formulate, uh, uh, in the time that is left, let me formulate the result in, the spe in a specific example, which in itself is uh, very beautiful and is due to Perez and Virag. So let us consider an example which is very different from the sign process and which just shows how different, uh, very different uh, problems lead to the appearance of determinantal point processes. So I want to consider, so uh, in these last five minutes we start completely afresh so one can forget everything that went on before. Uh, just, I consider, <clears throat> I consider a unit disk, I consider a random series sum a n z n. Uh, so where a n are independent complex Gaussians, independent complex Gaussians, standard complex Gaussians, standard complex Gaussians, so we, of zero expectations and uh, unit variance. So and I consider the zero set, so this is a random function, I consider the zero set of this, so zero set of this holomorphic function. Uh, from your favorite uh, formula for the radius of convergence of a power series, it follows that the radius of convergence of this power series is equal to one. So this is a holomorphic function in the unit disk. So it has a collection of zeros. And the correlation function for this collection of zeros so is again determinantal and has the form, so let me, let me just write down this, so has the form just determinant of k xi xj, where k is a Bergman, k xy is the Bergman kernel. Please observe that we are now in a complex situation and please also observe that what does it mean Bergman kernel? Bergman kernel is projection on, from the space of square integrable function of the disk to the space of holomorphic square integrable function of the disk, the Bergman space. So Bergman space. So uh, Bergman space is the space of holomorphic f in L2, and f is holomorphic, so the ortho ortho orthogonal basis is given by the monomials z to the n, the uh, norm of the monomial z to the n is k plus 1, and so one arrives at this uh, formula for the reproducing kernel, uh, or for this, now I still have five minutes, uh, so for the, reproducing, uh, uh, for the reproducing kernel of this uh, space, and uh, uh, so, in fact, the distribution of zeros of this x 
is a determinantal process uh, with this kernel. Here it is. So this is correlation functions, correlation functions of our point process, correlation functions of our point process. So, and this is a very beautiful theorem of Perez and Virag from 2003. So the experts in the audience can correct me. I, 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 unless I'm mistaken, there doesn't exist a simple proof, a three-line proof of this theorem. So all proofs, at least all the ones I know, involve heavy computations. And uh, maybe, and my favorite one is the proof by Krishnapur, in which uh, he realizes these zeros of a uh, random Gaussian series as <coughs> eigenvalues, but obviously not of a unitary matrix. Eigenvalues of a unitary matrix lie on the unit circle. Eigenvalues of a corner of a unitary matrix. If one takes unitary matrix, cuts out a corner, and takes the limit in appropriately, then one gets this. Uh, so, uh, but still, e even the proof of Krishnapur requires some non-trivial computations, and it's, so this beautiful statement still lacks a simple proof. So, uh, just uh, let me point out that from the formula of Perez and Virag, it follows that the zero set is invariant under Lobachevsky and isometries. It is useful to consider the unit disk as the Poincaré model of the Lobachevsky plane, and so Lobachevsky and isometries act on it and preserve the distribution of x. They do not preserve the distribution of the function itself. So, and uh, the statement which uh, we proved in this case, so in joint work with Hsu and Shamov. So is that, uh, so X is a uniqueness, is a uniqueness that, that for the Bergman space. For the Bergman space. This theorem is a, one can say, a cousin of uh, theorem of Gauche, and in fact it answers a question asked by Lyons and Perez for the Bergman space. So this means that if a function, if a function f is in Bergman space is uh, zero in restriction to x, then f is zero identically. And this is just a theorem that we proved, so, and which we will discuss in the course in great detail. And uh, uh, just to close for today, let me formulate the following result from uh, work in progress with Xu. So that uh, just, well, in this theorem, uh, we show that if a Bergman function is zero in restriction to x, then it is zero identically. So this means that a Bergman function is uniquely determined by its values in restriction to x. But how does one recover? How does one recover a Bergman function from its restriction to x? And in fact, uh, we give an answer. It's a, a partial answer uh, for reasons that we'll discuss in the course. But let me just formulate uh, the answer so that almost surely the function can be recovered as follows, f of z. So it can be recovered by Patterson-Sullivan construction. Construction. So I write the corresponding uh, Poincaré series. So D is the Lobachevskian distance. So yes, so sum x and x. Sum has to be understood in principal value in the sense that one sums over, over um, annuli. So here I take the sum these. So this series, this series converges is f is, if, if s is bigger than 1 and diverges if s is equal to 1. So I take limit as s goes to 1. So in fact, this is limit along a subsequence, along a subsequence. And so then through this formula, almost surely one recovers the values of a Bergman function from the values of its restriction on realization of our determinantal point process. Thank you very much.